What is up, everyone? Welcome back to Let's Play Devil May Cry. We're on mission 18 out of only 23, so we're actually probably going to be finishing things off in this episode. So I guess what I should be saying is, welcome to the finale of Let's Play Devil May Cry. Starting with mission 18, the Spirit Stone Elixir. Throw the Philosopher's Egg into the fire and transform it into a Spirit Stone. Let's get this started. Sparta. Yeah, look at that big cool Soul Calibur sword. Sparta is the true form of Force Edge, the sword we started the game with. It's vastly more powerful than either Force Edge or Alistair. Uh, it gets a couple of its own moves. Round Trip kind of transforms it into that polearm. Uh, it gets its own stinger, and it is our final weapon of the game. Unfortunately, there's a couple downsides, like it doesn't have an air hike, you can't devil trigger with it, so I'm still going to be defaulting to Alistair and Ifrit. It does have its uses though, which we uh, will explore maybe later on. And suddenly we're dunked back into a pool of water. Uh, this is, I want to say, either the last or the penultimate underwater sequence. There might be one more that I'm forgetting. Yeah, there is. There's actually a, a short one just after we get out of here. And if you're starved for red orbs, it's always worth exploring all these cells because there is usually a couple of hidden caches or, you know, there's blue orb fragments hidden around in the barrels. I didn't realize that was there. Uh, and there's usually red orbs inside the barrels too, so break everything with a needle gun that you can and you'll be good to go. And this is uh, our last underwater fight, I think. Finally against something other than blades. So a lot of stuff happened last time. I should have gotten to this earlier. Um, and more is gonna be happening towards the end of this episode as we approach the climax of the game. So why don't we recap the story so far? Dante here is the son of uh, the legendary Dark Knight Sparta, whose namesake is uh, preserved in the weapon we just got. And Sparta was kind of a righteous demon, and he, Dante, was also born to a human mother, Ava, along with his brother, Virgil. Um, his dad, Sparta, sealed away this demon king, Mundus, who we've heard a little bit about long, long ago. But Mundus is trying to resurrect here on Malay Island, and Mundus was also in some way responsible. Well, I meant to hit a ledge there. There's a blue orb fragment there. Um, he's also somehow responsible for the death of Dante's mom, Ava, and the corruption of his brother, Virgil. So Dante's hellbent on revenge, and that's our whole through line of the plot. So at the beginning, Trish came in saying that she knows where Mundus is, and she knew about Sparta and all that, and she looks like Dante's mom, Ava, so Dante goes with her. And for some reason, hitting that dial floods the room like the opening scene from Inception. Just go with it. Um, actually on a timer here, so I'm going to take a brief aside. Yeah, the water eventually sinks back down. Oh, am I on the right place? Yeah, I am. Okay, there's a key item here. Uh, so, yeah, he goes with Trish, trusting her implicitly. And we're starting to get close to the underworld here uh, towards the last third of the game, where we're going to finally encounter Mundus eventually. And last time... At the end of the last episode, we actually killed our brother Virgil, who's been stalking us, us this whole time as Nello Angelo. And last time, Trish was also revealed to be working for Mundus. Oh, kind of a mouthful. Um, anyway, I had another reason to recap that, and it's to segue into this. Someone posted a comment on an earlier episode about whether or not Devil May Cry and Bayonetta's universe are actually, uh, whether or not there's a overlap there. The answer is, uh, maybe. Probably? I don't know. 
there's a lot of stuff you could chalk up to uh, being Easter eggs that tie them together, but then there's really big stuff like the Enzo and Devil May Cry and the one from Bayonetta. They're confirmed to be the same person. Oh, and in Bayonetta, uh, there's a character named Antonio Redgrave, if you haven't watched either of those playthroughs or if you haven't played it. Uh, he was a journalist, and he was also Luca's dad. So, Dante used to use the alias Tony Redgrave because of a journalist he really respected. Uh, that's an in-universe thing. It's even the inscription on his handguns, Ebony and Ivory. They read something like, uh, for Tony Redgrave by 45 artworks or something. But, until there's an actual, you know, official crossover, which I hope to God for, nothing is really official, so take it all with a grain of salt. But can you imagine? Yo, oh man, I want a wonderful 101 Devil May Cry vein at a crossover game. Just hooking into my veins. Okay, and we have our second encounter against Nightmare. The timing worked out with that little aside uh, pretty well. This one takes place in a much smaller arena. Um, aside from him having a little bit more health and damage, I don't really think that much changes here. Uh, I actually think the more cramped arena makes him a little bit easier to fight. Except for the camera back here. I can't see what the hell is going on. Um, just go balls out anyway. Uh, I think this form, he gains this little boomerang attack, which I'll try to show off later. Oh. Well, if he cooperates, he'll show it off himself. So I'm just going to try to keep the dials lit. Uh, because... Oh, Freeze Ray. That's because I was in front of him. Uh, all of his attacks are triggered by where you are in relation to him. So if you're in front of him, he tries to do the Freeze Ray. If you're behind him, he does the uh, missiles. And... Oh, ah, God. I'm getting trapped. Uh, if you're on the side, he skewers you with his little uh, spear. Go on, get. There's the boomerang, but I think I deflected it just with a little rolling blaze uh, jump. Should have him here. Yeah, there we go. Nice, I don't get too many nightmare fights that are that close to clean. Not quite spotless, but, you know, passes the smell test. You can run to the ATM in that. <laughs> um, our Philosopher's Egg, post ass whooping of Nightmare, has now matured into a lovely blue elixir, which will help us get into the underworld. And collecting it will also end mission 18. Not too long there. Good, good, good. And we'll go immediately into mission 19, entering the corrupted world. This is, uh, I believe, going to be our first taste of the underworld. Before we do that, though, yeah, as long as I have the orbs for it. Uh, purple orbs give you one more rune in the Devil Trigger gauge. So it's always worth buying those. Uh, I don't think you can come across those any other way except buying them from the shop. I believe I'm going to be coming out here. Could be wrong. Actually... Nope, nope, nope. I am going the right way. I will pop in here. Just to bully a marionette. Okay, yeah, and that'll lead me back out to where I put the staff of Hermes in, and then I want to go back to the bedroom where we got a blue orb last time. Because the elixir is responding strongly to the other uh, mirror, or the other painting. And this is now our only way back into the bedroom where we initially encountered Nello Angelo. And the mirror is also responding to the elixir. Oh, my bad. I thought something was going to happen on its own. Uh, so this time we can actually enter the mirror. And this is what is known as the mirror world. Uh, I believe it's here next to the bed in the mirror world that you can actually pick up Nightmare Beta if you missed him back in uh, the Colosseum mission a couple uh, a couple missions ago. And there are blue orbs you can get 
pretty easily around the sides. Uh, I don't think I can get any more blue orb upgrades, so I'm not gonna bother with those anymore. Yeah, I think the first ones always do that automatically. Really, really awesome enemy design that one is. I believe that's the the final new enemy type we're going to be encountering, or that we're going to be introduced to here. The Nobody. Uh, you can tell they saved the best visual design for last. Looks like a Silent Hill monster. Kind of like a mannequin from Silent Hill 2 crossed with like a slurper or a twin victim or something. They are unsettling to look at, unsettling to listen to, and they're pretty dangerous to fight. Just an all-time great monster design visually. I still like Plasmas and Frosts to fight a little bit more, but... They've, they've got some stuff. Uh, you have to watch being around them when they die, because those exploding chunks, ah, they, uh, they will hurt you. So the deal with nobodies is they start off pretty small and weak, but left to their own devices, they dance around like what happened to that cutscene, and they grow into some really big problems. More health, um, higher damage, more attacks, grabs, a lot of stuff. They can leash your devil trigger like a nightmare. I think I'm gonna come up. Oh, yeah, big vortex in the sky. Dead zone vortex. Uh, it's not the angle I wanted to read that at. There we go. Get a better look at it. Pure evil amassed in the sky. And then... Where the hell am I going? Oh, jeez, I got myself lost. Which is really, really hard to do in a game like this, because... There we go! Oh, God. Painted on door texture. <laughs> Painted onto the wall. Ah, uh, not my best moment. Not my best moment. Let's see. Got the Philosopher's Stone there, so... Do I want to be heading back now? Sorry, this part kind of escapes me a little bit. Yeah, I... Oh, right, I know where I'm going now. The, uh, puddle where we initially encountered Nightmare. Yeah, instead of doing some platforming, we will vortex across. Because platforming in Devil May Cry 1 is absolutely atrocious. Yeah, so this is the room where we... Yeah, the Surge of Evil is re uh, reacting to the Elixir, starting to activate. The room where we initially fought Phantom and Nightmare, actually. Now that we have the Elixir, it serves as our passage into the Underworld. Uh, this... that serves as an elevator... What is that for? Oh, that's for later on, when we backtrack through here. The Gates of the Underworld. And that is it. For Mission 19 as well. Damn, they're passing by quick. Alright, and we're gonna go straight into 20. All we have left is, uh, four missions, and we're only... what is that? I can't see from here. Uh, like 15 minutes into the recording? Yeah, it's not gonna take terribly long to, uh, finish this out, unfortunately. One of the fatal flaws of Devil May Cry 1 is that it is very, very short. Even on your first playthrough, it's only a good four or five hours long. It's tight, but damn. I always wind up wanting more of Devil May Cry. Uh, that fatal flaw becomes the saving grace of Devil May Cry 2, though, because Devil May Cry 2 is even shorter, and mercifully so. Got Frost in this room. Uh, Frost's always come in pairs, so there's the other one. Just wondering where he was at. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. Got hit by that AoE. I always react wrong to that. Nope, oh, again. Yeah. Come on. 
Jesus, how is this boss kicking my ass so hard? Uh, the statue of time blocking the camera isn't exactly helpful. Yeah, as you progress further and further, it becomes more and more Silent Hill-esque. And just like that, we have our final encounter against Nightmare as well. Every boss has uh, three encounters. This one is easily the hardest. Uh, not because of anything that's going to happen for most of the fight, but because the end of the fight is chaos. It's uh, quite hectic. On the other hand, Ifrit really, really makes some of this a breeze. Ifrit is so good, especially for the Nightmare fight. Because one string lights up the dials, and then Killer B auto tracks to the core. Plus, you could do some really crazy parrying with Rolling Blaze. Ifrit's amazing for this fight. Uh, that should be his first form, just like that. No, his core seated. There we go. Come on. Ooh, I almost got frozen. I think you have to waggle out of it if you do. There we go. This should be. Damn it! I keep speaking a little bit too soon. Come on. Come on. better than to trust a stranger. Your presence has become a hindrance to my master's bloody scheme. Now die! This is where Nightmare gets a little bit tough. Uh, luckily on normal, you leave him off with so little health that you can kinda... Oh hell, not when he's on the ceiling like this. You can kinda just burn him down uh, before you get too overwhelmed. But in this state, he just goes nuts. Like, it's like he devil triggers in this stage. He just starts spamming all of his most dangerous attacks, plus you get Trish helping him out. Uh, yeah. Luckily, he's at low enough health, you can just burn him.
There we go. So even though Trish betrays him, Dante still bothers to help her out. Because she looks like his mom. He's got some complicated emotions going on. Some Oedipal feelings. <laughs> oh, that's gonna do it for Mission 20, though. As we move right on into Mission 21, uh, I should have enough for... No, I don't actually. Yeah, every time you buy an orb, uh, the subsequent ones become more expensive. So, I guess I'll save up for the next one. Let's see, I believe there's something special somewhere in this room. Is it through here? No, it's not. So let's backtrack for a second so I can find this. Uh, I thought it was right there. It's gotta be somewhere around the outside wall. It's not that, I don't think. No, that's where I came from. Oh, no! No, 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 no. Uh, I'll come back to it later. I'm looking for a hidden entrance somewhere to a secret mission. Uh, unlike the other ones, that secret mission that I'm looking for does not lead to a blue orb fragment. It leads to a very special item. I'm gonna be... Ah, uh, this is why I should have not practiced run of this. Or at least looked item locations up ahead of time. I'm gonna be really, really disappointed if I don't get to show off the thing I'm thinking of. Uh, for now, though, I guess we'll just try and move ahead. Maybe I'm misremembering the uh, general area where the thing is located. I'm just gonna kind of scour the area. Because I am a little bit unsure of what the path is. Yeah, a lot of this is gonna get cut out. Yeah, I think I know where I'm going. Uh, still no sign of the entrance to the secret mission. It's a wall you have to inspect around here somewhere. Oh, hey, it looks like holy water? Yeah, holy water. Maybe it's not around- ah, I don't- I don't know. Um, in case I do miss it, which seems really likely at this point, uh, oh, I'm gonna regret it if I skip it. I don't think you have to do all the other secret missions. Maybe that's a requirement. I don't know. Um, the item I'm looking for is called the Bangle of Time. It's the same accessory you get in Beautiful Joe and Bayonetta, and it replaces your Devil Trigger with a Time Stop. And I'll cut my way through all of these probing tentacles. Ugh. I think the nobodies here show up one by one, so you can just spam Stinger at them uh, to lock them down if you have a hard time with them. Which, yeah, sometimes that can happen. Alternate between high time and uh, Stinger, get the stylish ranking up. And wait for him to explode. Man, there we... There are going to be so many people in the comments going, You're an idiot. You missed it. It's like one inch to where you were at this time stamp. The Bangle of Time secret mission. Ah, well. Uh, grenade roll canceling also works really well against these guys. Because uh, the grenade gun builds up your devil trigger so efficiently. But if you have them one-on-one... -on -one, you can lock them down pretty easily. It's when they start coming in groups that they uh, become a nuisance. Oh, oh yeah, and there are little hands that pop up underground, or from underground, if you stand still too long. Forgot about them. And uh, those probing tentacles will harm you, slowly drain your health if you touch them. And they don't stay dead for very long, I don't think. All right, let's go. Uh, this is another thing you can do to cancel uh, your grenade. You don't have to jump or roll. You can also cancel it with a stinger. So you can alternate between firing the grenade and stingering to cancel the animation of the reload. Ooh. 
Oh, I hear plasmas. Oh, and they're in bat form. I love this form. Can I get a better camera angle on them? Ah, uh, at least those ones are in frame. There we go. Uh, they're not gonna last too- Oh! They're a little bit tougher than I thought. That one took like five grenades to the face. Good shit, Plasma. Love these things. Oh wait, I have Alistair on. Let me switch. There we go. Uh, that might, in fact, be the last set of Plasmas we fight in the game. Come to think of it, we're really winding down. The next two chapters in a row are both boss fight chapters. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There are a couple of enemies in, I believe, the final chapter. I think there are a couple of Frosts to fight. For a second, I thought that was something to get the heart beating. Ah, uh, no, this is just another Orb Fountain. Slightly different variation on your uh, Bright and Butter combo. Get six hits instead of four. That dial raises a, a series of platforms up. So that you can eventually make it to your objective. Which is mainly just to get the heart going and to uh, peel away the, the seal over the door in that main heart chamber. Which we're conveniently back in, actually. And I think that actually does it for mission 21 I said we're on? Yeah. What a creepy room. Yeah, that indeed does it for mission 21. All we have left now is the final boss. That is a good ass background for the legendary battle. We'll get one more Devil Trigger rune before we proceed forward. Wow, this is dramatically different from the room we were just in pristine looking chapel Again I must face a Sparta. Strange fate, isn't it? Strange and ironic that it will end the same way. <laughs> I really has favored you this time. Look there.
Whose eyes? Deep in them, I see the same light as in Sparta's eyes. Why my mother? That useless being. If you need a mother, I can create it. As many as you want. Just like I created Trish. Silence! Yo, it's Space Harrier! You didn't think we were ending without a Space Harrier section, did you? Even what, 14 years ago? Capcom, Clover, Little Devils, Platinum, whatever. If it's associated with Kamiya, expect a shmuff section. Uh, this one is pretty fun, aside from the fact that the controls are inverted. Uh, it's a lot better than the one in Bayonetta 1, I'll say that. Uh, when you unleash your Devil Trigger gauge, since we're kind of already Devil Triggered, we're already in our Devil form, it releases that big ass energy dragon. Oh, god damn it! Took a hit that time. Uh, you can see there are little rotating orbs around him. Uh, you have to destroy those blue orbs in order to make him vulnerable. Uh, also, about that dragon I was talking about a second ago, the more uh, Devil Trigger runes you have available when you summon that attack, the stronger it is. Uh, so, pretty much just constantly stay mobile. And you'll be good to go. Uh, this might be over way too quick because of the, uh, the Devil Trigger attack. Uh, you can also... Ah, that's, why I was, that's the timing I was looking for, actually. When he kind of shields himself with his wings, uh, you can get a double hit with it. Makes it twice as effective. So we'll get one more cycle of this, it looks like. Oh, meteors this time, shit. Meteors and I think lightning in the background. Lasers too, shit, shit. So yeah, we're, even though this is gonna be over really quickly, we're still seeing a lot of his attacks. That one will sweep right to left. And then I don't think there's a third one. Yeah, the goal here is just destroy the blue orbs uh, and stay very mobile so you don't get hit by these rapid-fire projectiles that are constantly coming at you. There we go. And just like all the other bosses, we have three fights against Mundus. This one counts as the second one. Uh, he's immobilized in this giant pool of lava, very Ragnaros-esque. Uh, and we have Sparta for this fight. Uh, Sparta is going to be our weapon of choice. Oh, no. Round tripped it into the rock. Uh, those will occasionally obscure your shots. You're going to be spamming a lot of grenades and round trips and uh, projectiles in Devil Trigger form while he shoots projectiles out from these orbs. Uh, you can also destroy the orbs. He'll be summoning... A there we go, a dragon. Uh, the dragon will replenish your Devil Trigger gauge, and I think it also gives you a little bit of health back. Yeah! It gave me uh, almost all my health back. So, this is your new Devil Trigger form for this fight. This is a pretty dead easy fight, to be honest. Uh, there are a couple of tricks you can pull off. Oh, I should also mention, Sparta gets some new abilities for this fight. Uh, he gets a Devil Trigger finally. He gets, I think, a version of Meteor, which I keep trying to do. And uh, I want to say he also gets an Air Hike, which doesn't really come in handy. 
Round trip is useful enough here, though. Just keep rolling, just keep rolling. Wait for those to get out of my way so I can hit him with a round trip, do a little bit of extra chip damage while I shoot away. And, uh, oh yeah, you want to destroy those uh, orbs because they'll eventually turn them into meteors. Yeah, you just keep spamming projectiles and double trigger. Whittles him down pretty quickly. Plus, he summons these big lava dragons. And you get nice big health refills from them. Come on. Oh no, I want to take it out. There we go. Oh, you get double trigger refills from those, and then health from the dragons. Makes this kind of a cakewalk, actually. I don't remember... I don't think the health is there on uh, Dante Must Die. Plus, you don't get uh, constant regeneration in double trigger mode on Dante Must Die. The fight is still not hard, no matter what difficulty you play it on. You just have to be a little bit more careful in some instances. Oh, no. Uh, this way? Yeah. There we go. Oh, that filled me up. Good. Spawned right in front of me and filled me up. My father's also here now. Rest in peace. There it is. There it is. Uh, I thought that came before the Mundus fight. Yeah. Ah. Uh, some of the best bad voice acting around. It's Mega Man X4 levels of hilarious shittiness. <laughs> it's up there with like, you were almost a Jill Sandwich and the X4 lines and it was foretold by Gyromancy. <laughs> I genuinely appreciate that stuff. Uh, but we have the final mission of the game. Trish is apparently dead and with Mundus apparently defeated, we have nothing left to do but escape Malay Island before the whole thing comes down on our heads, which includes backtracking through everything we've been through so far, uh, the underworld included. That five minute time limit is awfully generous, by the way. Uh, there are only, yeah, there are a couple of frosts which were there on, in the first plate. Do I have to fight? No, this is the way I, I go uh, to backtrack. Even getting a little bit turned around, it's still very easy to make it through this. I think I'm gonna have to fight these snow bodies. Yeah. 
Oh, and they're getting a good old chance to grow big. Big and large. Well, that's fine. Devil trigger, and do some vortexing and aerating. I'll finish them off pretty quick. Did the other one that just grew shrink? No, I think it was just the third one. Maybe? Not sure, actually. Okay. Yeah, I think the big one shrank back down. That's lucky. Okay, I'll take it. Alright, what do we have? Four minutes left. More frosts. Which we saw the first time. Uh, this is the part that kind of reveals how small and compact the levels are. Because you're going through all of them all at once, and it's like, wow. This takes no time to get through it all. Oh, the elevator was behind this. Right, right, right. Having little miniature brain farts. Oh, come on, get up there. Fuck, one last fuck you from the platforming. The elevator is what takes us back up into the room where we first encountered Phantom and Nightmare. And that was just an interlude. I think the timer stops here. Oh no, I'm dead wrong about that, actually. I believe the timer stops somewhere up ahead. Could be dead wrong about that, too. It's out here that I want to go, right? Yeah. Blades. There are a lot more enemies here than I thought. Encountered nobodies, blades, uh, frosts, marionettes. All of it, or almost all of it, totally skippable. Uh, it's gonna really hamper your end mission ranking if you skip all the enemies here, so... Oh! Some of it not skippable. Yeah. I was gonna find them anyway. Just for a couple orbs. That works. Come on, open up. Why does it take so long for the door to open? Mundus is back one more time. I told you, every boss is three fights. Uh, this one is falling apart a little bit. It's a very cool looking design, though. He's not very threatening in this form, though. Uh, you can use whatever spammy combo or move of choice you want against him. Uh, Vortex works really well here. Meteor works really well. Uh, the goal here is just to get him down to low critical health before he pushes you up against the wall and crushes you. So it turns out Trish is actually alive. Uh, now all we have to do is build up Devil Trigger, taunt him a little bit, and channel Devil Trigger into Ebony and Ivory, uh, and use that and Trish's power to blast him away? Something like that. It's 
the general idea. It looks like we have a winner. Jack. Give my regards to my son, will ya? Rock. <gasps> oh! Oh no! I forgot about this final section! I put the controller down! Um... Oh god. Uh... I... I Jesus, I can't course correct right now. <laughs> oh no! Oh, uh, it's just like the end of RE4 except you don't instantly die. What? This is real hard to control. Oh no, I'm just gonna hit everything. Whatever, I got enough health. Let's do it. Let's tank it. Oh my god, this is so bad. What a terrible way to end this. <laughs> oh no, I forgot about that. Forget though, the underworld's evil is still alive. They will someday return. There's no need to worry, right? Because the world has the legendary Dark Knight Dante and his sidekick. Devil never cry. Yes. Okay, great. Where's the place? We'll be right there. This one has the password. Sounds heavy. Okay, let's get it over with in ten minutes. We can't let a single one of those suckers live. Five minutes. <laughs> More than enough. The ending sequence was literally the end of RE4, except with a biplane instead of the jet ski. Huh, <sighs> that's Devil May Cry. Short ride, a little bit bumpy with a good coating of rust, but nonetheless, an incredible one to take, always worth taking. 
Uh, the HD collection preserved it so, so well. Uh, preserves it beautifully. If you have a PS3, grab the HD collection. You get two awesome games with it, plus Devil May Cry 2. Uh, the best is also yet to come, Devil May Cry 3, man. Devil May Cry planted the seed of character action, and that genre grew into something amazing over the years. Uh, my biggest takeaway from Devil May Cry 1 is just how tight it is. There's no fat to trim. Yeah, it's only a couple of hours long, but you can play it over and over, and there's nothing wasted here. That tightness extends deep into the design, too. Like, every tool in your belt is so useful. There's some stuff you might gravitate towards, yeah, but that's you just exploring the playstyle that you prefer. But at the same time, you have a tool for every situation. Nothing is useless here. It's small, uh, the tool set is small and versatile. This is something I've talked about in regards to, like, Mega Man X, but just to use that as an example, you always have, like, some clear, well-rounded powers, and then a good handful of ones that you have to force yourself to use because they're just not tightly designed around the scenarios you find yourself in-game. It's the exact opposite here, though. There's no bloat, no waste in anything. It's very, very tight. Not the deepest Devil May Cry, but definitely the tightest one. And it took a few games for Devil May Cry to really find its identity, but Devil May Cry benefits a lot from having... Oh, uh, the first game, I mean. Devil May Cry 1 benefits a lot from having so much Resident Evil in it, because it's this great mix of dynamic, stylish action and moody, gothic atmosphere, and it switches moods so well that never it's never like oil on water, it just meshes. Oh, and that's, that's about it. Going through the credits here, uh, I saw Yamada up there. I know he worked on a lot of Clover stuff. I think he directed Beautiful Joe 2. Um, I saw Ono up there. Holy shit, I didn't know Ono worked on Devil May Cry. Uh, Yusuke Hashimoto, I noticed scrolling across. He's worked on tons of stuff. If you don't know his name, you should, because most importantly, he directed Bayonetta 2. Yeah, Yusuke, you rock. Other than that, I kind of look at these a little bit more closely, because uh, the last time I looked at these, uh, there weren't too many names that I really recognize. Voice actors as usual. Uh, Kabamura, I think I've heard Kamiya talk about him. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it's not the same person. Not sure how common that surname is. Yeah, Kobayashi! And Mikami. Uh, Kobayashi is a name that deserves a lot more recognition. Doesn't have the star power of like a Mikami or Kamiya or Ono, but he produced Dino Crisis 2! And he played a huge role in uh, lots of old Cap- Yeah! Kamiya! Woo! Yeah! Um, yeah, Kobayashi was a producer in Devil May Cry 4, RE4. Uh, this game, obviously, one of the few OGs still at Capcom, I believe, him and uh, Itsuno, who was also instrumental for uh, the better Devil May Cry games. That's it for Devil May Cry, though. Thanks for watching, everyone. Make sure to, if you like this video, like, comment, and subscribe. Check back on the channel daily for more videos. And if you like my stuff enough, it would really help if you would make a contribution to my Patreon at patreon.com slash scribe so I can put out even more high-quality stuff. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one.